Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Well, howdy! howdy. <laughs> it's good to see you guys. Glad you're here. Happy Easter. Uh, if you have a Bible, we're in Psalm 118 today. Uh, if you don't have one, it'll be on the screens, or if you want a Bible, they're passing some out if you'd like one. Uh, but I want to read to you this song, Psalm 118, and then we'll pray and jump in, and I think you'll see why uh, we chose this for Easter. So Psalm 118, uh, starting in verse 1, <clears throat> says this, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress I called on the Lord, and the Lord answered me, and he set me free. The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He's become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you've answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you in the house of the Lord. The Lord is God. He's made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God. I'll give thanks to you. You are my God. I'll extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he's good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let me pray for us. Lord, thanks for this time and your word this morning. Thank you for every person here, God, whether we just couldn't wait to sit and think about the words of God or, or whether this is not a normal rhythm for us. Wherever we are on the spectrum of connecting with a church or with you, God, I just, I just thank you that we're all here and you've given us a moment to think with you about these words from your word. And I just want to ask for your help, God. Help us understand them. And I pray, God, help us feel the hope that's in them. And I just want to invite all of you, if you're willing, uh, take a minute, and, and if you're up for it, you talk to God right now and ask him, say, God, please teach me something right now. And then if you would, please pray for me that the Lord would use me and I'd be helpful to you. Well, Father, we love you. And we trust you. Use this time. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if I asked you to tell me what is the greatest song of all time, uh, I bet we'd get a lot of different answers. I'd be curious to hear them. It would probably be a pretty lively discussion that would break hard along generational lines. You know, some would say, well, obviously anything by the Beatles. Others would go, what? No, anything by T-Swift, thank you. And uh, on the argument could go on what is the greatest song of all time. Uh, but it's interesting, Rolling Stone magazine did some sort of research on this, and they decided Rolling Stone says that the greatest song of all time is Like a Rolling Stone by Bob Dylan. <laughs> they said second, according to Rolling Stone, 
is I can't get no satisfaction by the Rolling Stones. And so according to Rolling Stone, the best song ever is Like a Rolling Stone, and the second is a song by the Rolling Stones. And some of you may go, well, Ben, that's all wonderful, but this is Easter. There's a totally different Rolling Stone we should be talking about. Isn't there? Like, why are you on this? And I would say this. Whatever you say the greatest song of all time is, I think all of us would agree that there are songs out there that tend to transcend their genre and, and transcend even their moments in time and become kind of anthems for the ages. And I'm telling you that because the song we just read, and that's what it is, it was a song. The word psalm is Greek for a song. It was a song. And the song we just read is in competition for, maybe I think at the top of the list of the greatest songs of all time. That the Jewish people starting centuries ago began to sing this song multiple times at ceremonies throughout the year and continue to do so. It's also one of the most quoted Old Testament texts in the New Testament. The people of Jesus loved this song. They sang it all the time. And not only did they love it, Jesus loved it. This song became the soundtrack of the last week of Jesus' life. You know, the last week of Jesus' life gets one-third of the space in the Gospels written about Jesus. It was more than just the sequentially last week in Jesus' life. It was the culmination of his life. And as he entered into that week, on the first day, the crowds in Jerusalem sang the song over him. Jesus quoted this song all through the week. And then Jesus and his disciples sang this song together before he walked out of his last supper for, to be betrayed and crucified. And then the New Testament church quoted this song all throughout the New Testament to give us perspective on what Jesus was doing at Easter. So this song is kind of a big deal. They used to call it the great Hillel, the great praise song, or they would call it just the song, which that's a pretty popular song if you can just say, hey, play the song, and everyone knows what song you're talking about. It was this one. And so if we're going to appreciate Easter and come around how Jesus saw Easter, I think it would be cool to tune in to the soundtrack of the most important week in human history. And here's the reality, too. It's, it's not just, uh, let me give you some Easter trivia this morning. Wouldn't that be great? There's, there's a practical application to it with us, too. And that is, if you understand the song, one of the New Testament writers said, if we can get the realities in this song into our minds, he says, then you can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I shall not fear. What can man do to me? He said, the people that really understand the message of the song, they're not afraid anymore. And all of us, if we're honest in here, have things we're afraid of. There's some calamities that we said, if that overtook me, I don't know what I would do. And that scares us. Or if I lost this thing in my life, I wouldn't just lose a thing, I would lose me. I don't know if I would want to continue living. All of us have fears of something coming from us, stealing life from us, of an addiction or a difficulty or a calamity taking from us. We're afraid, and this psalm gives us the remedy to fear. And so what I want to do is I want to look at it and say, why did they sing it even in its Old Testament context? Where did it come from when it was sung and written in about 1,000 B.C.? And then we'll say, and what did it have to do with Jesus on Easter? And then how does it relate to us as we walk through the fears that are waiting for us outside these doors? And so to look at it in its Old Testament context, just in case you missed it as I was reading it, Psalm 118 is an upbeat song. It's a happy song. It's a celebration. And it starts with a call to praise. Someone saying, give thanks to the Lord for he's good, for his love endures forever. He's like, hey, we should all be celebrating God today because he's good and his love endures forever. And then he starts this call response thing. Like if we all started celebrating, it wasn't enough for him because he's like, let all of Israel say, that's all the Jewish people, his love endures forever. And he says, let the house of Aaron, that's all the leadership say, his love endures forever. And he says, that everyone who fears the Lord, that was all the non-Jews that would come to worship at the temple in the Old Testament. He says, you say it. So literally he's like, Israel, let me hear you. Aaron, where you at? All the non-Jewish people, okay, you do it too. All right, and he's just like, everybody should be singing praises to God because his love endures forever. Now, you don't have to be some uh, bibliologist to kind of gather the theme he's trying to put forward in verses one through four, and that is, I think he's trying to lay out there, God's worth praising because his love endures forever. That God has a care for his people that never stops 
never perishes, never fades, never leaves. And the word we translate steadfast love, it's the word chesed in, in Hebrew. It's, it's the theme of your whole Bible. It's covenantal love. Love that binds itself to you and will never let you go. The closest thing we get is marriage. That when you get married, you decide, I want to not just tell this person, I think you're great. You go, I think you're great, and I'm going to bind our bank accounts and lives and <laughs> futures together. And so you gather your friends, family, in front of God and everybody. You stand up there and look them in the face and say, I'm binding myself for you. And then to make sure they know you're serious, you say, for better or for worse, I'm linking up to you. And if it goes great, I'm here. And if it goes bad, I'm still here in sickness and in health. Till death do us part, whether we're richer, whether we're poor, no matter what happens to you and me, no matter how great it gets or how sideways everything goes, I'm not going anywhere. That's the best we know how to say it. Covenantal love that never leaves. And what the psalm is saying is God is worth celebrating today because when he puts his love on you, he never runs out on you. His love never fails. It endures. But you hear that and you go, okay, like, I would like to believe that's true. Wouldn't that be nice? How do I know that's the case? So you want me to sing it, but if I'm not feeling it, like, how do I get there? And so a single voice takes over in verse 5 and starts to tell you why the love of God is worth celebrating. And he says, out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. He says, let me tell you why I'm telling you to sing this. It's because I was in real trouble. I got in a situation where it went real bad, real fast, and I had nothing left but to cry out to God, and God came through for me in the moment of my distress. He said, and not only did God come through for me, the Lord is on my side. He's still there, so I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is my helper. I shall look and triumph on my haters. That's what he says. He says, nobody will ultimately have victory over me. No besetting sin, no family difficulty, no calamity, nothing will ever ultimately triumph over me because God's on my side and I can't lose. And then he starts to teach us. And so everybody, it's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. He said, there's going to come a moment when the storm hits and you're going to look for refuge and we're all going to look for refuge at different times. You may look for it in your money. You may look for it in a person. You may look for it just on your phone to get out of an awkward conversation. We all run to different refuges in different moments. And he says, let me tell you something. We run to men. We run to princes. If that guy's on my side, then I'll have the right connections. He says, all that stuff will fade. But when life went really south for me, God showed up. And he's a refuge you can trust in. And then he gives you the specifics of his situation. In verse 10, he says, let, let me unpack for you what was happening for me. In case you missed it, he said, all nations surrounded me. And when he says that in verse 10, you get the picture of this is not an ordinary guy who wrote this song. You don't say, all nations surrounded me if you're a farmer. Right? And you realize this song was written by the king, the king of Israel which in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was surrounded by nations that were hostile to them and wanted to kill them. So notice, it's not a metaphor. It's not like it was like I was totally surrounded. He's like, no, it's, it was, I was surrounded by people that wanted to kill me. That's kind of how it went. And militarily as a king, like the worst position to be in tactically is surrounded. He was like, uh, this is real bad. And he says, I was surrounded by all nations. But then he says, in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. He said, I was in the worst possible position and yet God strengthened me, and I was victorious. And then he just goes off for a few verses. They surrounded me, surrounded me, surrounded me, surrounded me. I cut them off, I cut them off, I cut them off. And we're like, I get it, okay. The whole point is, I was in deep distress, and God delivered me. That's the point. And the beautiful thing about that is, there's no arrogance in the song. You know, most kings back then, when they would write about their triumphs militarily, were real arrogant about it, you know? They're sort of like politicians even today. You know, they were like, I did this and I did that and I'm the greatest for these following reasons. Uh, that's how ancient kings wrote too. We have writings of the king of Assyria, a neighboring country, that this is one of his. I don't know if you've ever wanted to hear the wisdom of the ages. Let me just read to you from the king of Assyria. I am powerful. I am all powerful. I'm a hero. I'm gigantic. I'm colossal. I am honored. I am magnified. It goes on for a while, but are y'all catching the flavor of it? Um, 
it's uh, just kind of arrogant. And this king is so interesting because he gets in front of his people and he goes, hey guys, I was in deep trouble. It was bad. There's no pomp in this guy. He said, but the Lord delivered me and the strength of the Lord infused me and I cut off my enemies and I rose in victory. I was in distress, but I got delivered. Praise be to God. Now, if you're cynical listening to the song, maybe you're still not singing it yet. Back then, maybe some other people are jumping in. You're in the back like, oh, you want me to praise God for a love that endures because he helped you out that one time? How would that give me any confidence he's going to help me? Like if I stood up here and said, hey, God helped me this one time, so God will help you when you're in problem. You're like, well, maybe. How do I have any confidence he'll come through for me in my day of distress? And what's interesting is he answers that by quoting in verse 14 the oldest song in Israel's history. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. That's a direct quote. He samples from Moses. Moses, they wrote this song when they were in the Exodus. You know, in the book of Exodus, the nation was slaves in Egypt. And God came and sent plagues hammering into Pharaoh to loosen his grip. And Moses led his people out. You remember, let my people go. And he led them out. And they wandered around in the desert, kind of in circles, got a little lost. It wasn't the best exit. And, uh, but then they landed at the edge of the Red Sea. And they're like, we can't cross through the sea. And then Pharaoh decides, you know what? I'm just going to kill him. And so he rides up. And so the nation of Israel is like, okay, so we can either drown or get slaughtered. This is so bad. And so they do what anyone would do when they're surrounded. They panic and basically emotionally fold like lawn chairs. It's not pretty. And in the moment of their distress, God shows up and does the impossible, the seas part. And they walk through the sea and they survive. And not only do they walk through the sea, as Pharaoh's army enters the sea, the sea closes and wipes out their enemy. So all in a moment, the impossible set them free and their enemy was destroyed. And so they looked at this moment and as they hit the other side of the beach, they just went, unbelievable! And they broke out into song. You can read it. Someone got a tambourine out and they just went bonkers, right? And they just started singing. They were like, the horses are in the sea. The riders are in the sea. Like, it was so bad. Like, Bill was crying. Everybody was freaking out. And then God showed up. He is our strength, so he is our song. It becomes easy to worship when you know you've been rescued. And they say, man, he is our salvation. We were in a bad way, and he helped me. And so catch this. This king sings, and he goes, God helped me that one time. And you go, well, how do I know he's going to help me? He goes, that's how our nation started. It started with God showing up. We were in distress, and he delivered. And so when he hit my life and my circumstances, I hit distress, and he delivered. So when you hit your distress, he delivers because that's how he rolls. That's the God who he is. And so glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous because I won't die, I'll live. God has not given me over to death. And then he says, open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter in. And you go, what does that mean? Well, what you realize in that moment is this isn't just the king. This is a very particular kind of song he's writing. He's saying, open the gates. This is a processional song. There's actually a, a word for it. It was called a triumph the way it would work back then was when a king rode out to battle, uh, if he was your king and some army was attacking and your king rode out to battle, you were pretty invested. Because if your king lost, then that enemy army would come over the hill and ride into your village. And uh, if you were a man, they'd kill you. And if you were a woman or a child, they would take you as slaves. So when your king said, I have to ride out to fight, you weren't just like, yeah, good luck with that. Let me know how it goes. You're pretty invested. My whole future is dependent upon whether or not he can be victorious. So you wait in bated breath. And then let's say a messenger comes running back and said, our king won. It was bad. He was surrounded. But he cut them off. And he won. You start celebrating. Why? Because it's not just like he won. We won. I wasn't in the battle. The king won the victory, but I get to enjoy the benefits. And so you start celebrating, and not only do you start celebrating, you get the city ready for the king to come back in and celebrate his victory. And so you get the roads ready for the king to arrive. The king and his men get ready. And then at the given moment, they would have a triumph. And the king would ride in on a horse. And the whole town would go to the outskirts of the town. Like you would go to the front door to meet a guest and bring them into your living room. They would go to the outskirts of the town, welcome the king, and then ride with him into the center of town, which was the temple. And that's where they'd go crazy and have a big holy barbecue. That's what the uh, sacrifice was about. And so that's what they would do. 
And so you see, this is the king riding in. And as he's riding, they're all celebrating the king. And the king's like, I was in distress. It was really nuts. God showed up. And so they're singing that as they ride in. And as they arrive at the temple, he says, open the gates of righteousness because I'm riding in. I have purchased the right for, my, for me to enter into a moment of celebration and not just for me. This is the gate of the Lord and the righteous shall enter into it. He plurals it. The king is victorious. The celebration is shared. I won it single-handedly, but the benefits are for all who will ride with the king. And so he comes into the temple and says, celebrate with me. I opened the gates of righteousness, of being right with God, and all who want to ride with the king get to join in the celebration. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. He said, I was humiliated like a reject, but I have risen to be honored, to be the one that the whole building's built on. So they cry out, save us, O Lord, And then they cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We knew we needed saving, and God sent one in his name, the king, to save us. And that's how the song ends, celebrating the victory of a king who won celebration for all, the king who was in distress but rose and was delivered for us. That's where the song ends. And you go, well, Ben, what does that have to do with Jesus? What does that have to do with him being in Israel, him dying on a cross. What does that have to do with any of it? Well, let me say this, and this is an interesting point uh, to get there. Joss Whedon is a director. Uh, He's done a lot of different movies, but you probably know Joss Whedon from The Avengers. You heard of that movie? Anybody? A few people? I see a head nod. Okay. The Avengers. It's a movie. Check it out. Made over a billion dollars. Yes, with a B, billion dollars. Pretty successful. A lot of people interested in Joss Whedon. Joss Whedon is uh, an outspoken atheist, has tweeted things about how uh, you and I are just sacks of chemicals trying to numb ourselves to avoid the void of an inevitable meaninglessness. Not real upbeat Twitter feed. (laughs) But he was in an interview, and I read the interview, and they said, okay, you don't believe there's a God, so you don't believe there's any meaning to all of our lives. We are literally, he says, just trying to tweak our chems to avoid the void. He said, that's how you see the world. There's no ultimate meaning or purpose to any of this. And he said, that's right. And so the reporter said, well, then how do you write these stories that are so epic about real evil that's really bad, real distress that's really wrong, and then real heroes that are really good, that step into the distress and bring freedom. You keep writing these epic stories about good triumphing over evil. Where do those come from? And this is what he said, and I'll quote it. He said, someone once asked me if I have anything like faith. And I said, I have faith in the narrative. I believe in a narrative, a story that's bigger than me, is alive, and I trust will work itself out. Isn't that interesting? He said, I believe there is a big story to all of this. And I believe that story is alive. And I believe that story is going someplace. And I believe it will work itself out. And so I want to tap into that story. And what's fascinating is the reporter didn't ask him about the obvious contradiction there. I believe there's no God and therefore no meaning. I believe there is meaning, a great story of good triumphing over evil. And I believe it's alive. Huh? And I think he believes this intellectually, and I don't understand why, but he feels this in his chest, and he writes all his stories about this. Why? I think he feels that there's a big story that's alive because there is a big story that's alive. I think he believes the story is alive because it's being written, and it's true because there is a big author who's alive. And God is writing a big story. And all of our little stories are little pictures of that big story. Look through all your favorite stories, and I promise you, they become this same story over and over again. Lord of the Rings. J.R.R. Tolkien writes a story about a king who arises from obscurity, goes to the valley of death to come out and win victory for his people with healing in his hands. And they asked him, was that a metaphor for something? And he went, huh, no, I just kind of wrote it. And then later in life, he said, you know what? I see Jesus Christ on every page. Jesus is the king who came, went through the valley of death, to rise and bring deliverance with healing in his hands. Harry Potter. Christians didn't like Harry Potter when it first came out. I don't know if you remember that. Cast your mind back. When the first book came out, we were like, this is witchcraft. We're like, kids are gonna wanna make spells like in the kitchen with chemicals. We can't endorse these books, get them out of here, right? And we all didn't like Harry Potter. 
Until what? The end. What happened at the end? The chosen one realizes to rescue his people, what does he do? He has to embrace embrace death, and by embracing death and dying to himself, he kills evil, and he rises victorious to give his people freedom from evil and death. And they asked J.K. Rowling, where did you get that story? And she said, "Ah, from Jesus. (laughs) Elsa and Anna! (laughs) What's the act of true love? Is it a smooch? No. It's being willing to step in front of certain death to lay my life down so you can live. And the glory of it is in doing that, she gets her own life back as well, right? We tell the story over and over again. Why do we do that? Because it's our story. And so don't miss this. When Jesus showed up in Jerusalem, he raised Lazarus from the dead the week before. Now, just a little tip. If you ever want to get famous fast, raise a dead guy. It'll get some attention, (laughs) And the people in Jerusalem realize this guy is taking death and bringing life. And so when he shows up in Jerusalem at the beginning of Holy Week, they gather around. And John 12, 12 tells us, the next day the large crowd that's come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming. So they took palm branches, a sign of nationalistic pride, and they went out to meet him crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Hosanna is the English word that translates the Greek word, Hosanna. (laughs) Hosanna in Greek is a translation of the Hebrew phrase, Hoshana, save us, O God. They quote Psalm 118. That as they see Jesus, the one who takes death and makes life, they go, you're the king. You're the king who enters into distress and brings life. And so they bring out their palm branches. They meet him at the edge of the city. And they say, we want to welcome you into our city in triumph. And they start waving the palm branches, a sign of nationalistic pride, saying, Hoshana, Hoshana, Hoshana. Here he is. He's the king. Blessed is the one who's come in the name of the Lord. The king is here. That little story we've sung year after year is now happening in our midst. And the big question in John is, what's Jesus going to do about that? Is he going to accept the praise of a king? Or is he going to demure and go, no, I'm just a prophet. I'm just a guy with some helpful advice on uh, your marriage and finances. What's he going to say? Well, as you read John and read all the Gospels, Jesus looks at his disciples and says, boys, I'm riding in. And he has them go get an animal for him to ride on. And I promise you that freaked them out. Because Jesus never rode anywhere. He walked everywhere his whole life. As he does this ride, he's out in Bethany. It's two miles from the center of Jerusalem. The two-mile ride takes all day. It doesn't take all day to ride two miles. It takes him all day. And as he gets to the temple at the end of the day, the temple's closed, so he walks back to Bethany. And then he wakes up the next morning, walks back to the temple, and walks in and out to the temple every day. He didn't have to ride in. It wasn't about the ride. It's not like my legs are tired. Like, you guys just want to catch a donkey tonight? Like, uh, that's not it. The ride wasn't about getting where he was going. The ride was a statement. Only kings ride in like that. And so John tells us he did it to, behold, to fulfill Zechariah. Fear not, O daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, riding on a donkey's colt. Now, why a donkey? Well, most kings rode in on horses. He rode in on a donkey to show I'm a gentle king. I'm not one coming to destroy you. I'm one coming to set you free. But Jesus says, I'm riding in because I'm making a statement. We call it the triumphal entry because it's a triumph. I am riding in as the king, and as they cry out to him, Psalm 118, you are the king who's coming to bring life from death. You are the king who's coming to bring deliverance. The religious leadership says, tell them to stop. You're not the king. You're just a good prophet. Tell them to stop. And do you remember Jesus' response? Jesus says, if I tell them to stop, the rocks will just start singing it. That's a pretty arrogant thing to say unless it's true. He says, I'm not gonna stop them because I am the king. I am the one who's come in the name of the Lord to bring deliverance, to set you free, to take fear away. That's who I am. I fulfill Psalm 118. And then he doesn't stop there. He goes to the Passover meal. That was his last supper. And that's where they would celebrate what happened in Exodus. And they would sing the song because it quotes the Exodus. We were in distress and God brought deliverance. And there was a script to the meal you were supposed to follow. You were supposed to break the bread and say, this is the bread of the affliction of our fathers when they were in Egypt. They said that as a script for, at this point, well over a thousand years. Everybody knew the script. It's like me asking you, have you ever heard the Pledge of Allegiance? You've heard it. 
They all know the script he was supposed to say. This is the bread of the affliction of our fathers. Jesus breaks the bread and says, this, this is my body. What happened back then was the little story that's telling the big story of what I've come to do. I'm the one who's going to break. I'm the one who gives redemption out of slavery. And then he took the cup of wine, and he was supposed to say, may the all-merciful one make us worthy of the days of the Messiah, the true king. And he says, this is about me. This is my blood about to be poured out. See, as the plagues landed on Egypt, the final one was death coming into every house in Egypt because all were guilty, and guilt brings judgment. But if you slaughtered an innocent lamb and put its blood on the top and sides of the door, judgment would pass over. You could be free from death and liberated from slavery if you trust in the sacrificial one. And Jesus said, that's me. Your stories in Psalms, your stories in Exodus, they're the little stories that all testify to the big story. I am the one who will pour his blood out. I will be the king that enters distress. I will go to that cross and suffer and die. But he says, but don't you worry because three days later I'm coming back. I will rise in victory and you will celebrate in my kingdom with me. I am the king who's stepping into distress, but I am bringing deliverance and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so how does that relate to us? The Bible presents what Jesus is doing in our lives now for those who ride with him as a triumph. Colossians 2 says we were dead in our trespasses and sins. That is that we were dead and we were enslaved, not to Egypt, not to surrounding armies, but we were enslaved to our own brokenness and sin, being far from what we were meant to be in humanity. And Colossians says to us, but God made us alive together with him. He brought life from death, having forgiven our trespasses, canceling the record of debt that stood against us. He set it aside, nailing it to the cross. God didn't set a list of our sins are nailed to the cross. He nailed his son to the cross that Jesus said, your distress, your sin, your brokenness, your failures, the addictions that run in your family, the calamities that have struck your life, the horrible things you've perpetrated against others, I'll take all of that onto me. He who knew no sin will become sin for us. I will be the sacrificial lamb so the judgment of God passes by and so that those of you who are in slavery can be set free. I'll enter your distress to win victory over sin and victory over death. And my distress brings deliverance. It says he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them in open shame by triumphing over them. When was the triumph? When the stone rolled away and said, I was in distress, but the Lord has not delivered me over to death. So ride with me. So 2 Corinthians says, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ that the picture of the Bible is for those who trust in Jesus Christ, we get to ride with the king. And at the end of all days, death is not the end for us. We rise to meet him and we ride with him as he establishes a new kingdom, a new earth, a new heaven forever. We get to ride with the king, a victory he won single-handedly over sin. The celebration counts for all who will trust in his name. So how does that relate to you? Let me beg you, if you don't know him, Peter stood up in Jerusalem days later in Acts 4 and says, the stone that was rejected has become this cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven among men that we might be saved. He said, God has made a way to be saved, to be rescued from our distress and our sin and our condemnation and brought into deliverance to enjoy God and be right in his presence. And he says, it's through Jesus. He says, there's no other name. There's no other remedy. There's no other way. God sent a solution, and it's his king. Know his king. And it's not arrogant to say that. It's loving to say that. It's not arrogant if you broke your leg for me to come to you and say, we have to set the bone. If someone else came and said, yeah, you know, or they could take some Advil. You go, what? No, they broke their femur. I got to set it. You're like, hey, man, don't be so narrow. There's other options. You can set it, or if you want to do chemo, you do that. Just whatever works for you. No wrong answers here. Be like, what? No, that's a terrible answer. 
There's all kinds of solutions you can present that won't heal the wound. And what God is saying is sin is really bad. We're surrounded. The distress is real. But God's made a way, a healer. He's brought the king who brings rescue. There's no other name, but there is a name. God has made a way. He beat death. He beat sin. He beat all the condemnation that would come onto your life. He's rescued us from that. And there's nothing but celebration left for those who ride with the king. And so that's why the writer of Hebrews says, we don't need to fear anymore. There's nothing we can be afraid of. If our king beat death, nothing else is much of a contest. I don't know if you know this, but when you square off with death, death always wins. Death takes everything, and yet one man beat it, our King Jesus. And he says, you ride with me, and death is not the end for you either. Death is not your end. And so no other smaller tragedy can have victory over you either. No addiction, no shame, no pattern in your life or your family story, none of that need to own you, no shame. We have a king who's victorious. Thanks be to God that he loves us enough to let us ride in victory with this king. That's the joy of Easter. Not just that Jesus beat death, but we all get to that ride with the king. Let me pray for us. Well, Father, I want to thank you that, Lord, we were in great distress. And if anyone doesn't believe that, just try to turn over a new leaf and be perfect. And we all read self-help books, but who's ever made themselves what they were meant to be by their own standards. There's something beautiful about all of us in the image of God. We're a marvelous creation, but there's something broken in all of us, and we can't heal it. We can't mend it. But thank you that you sent a king to enter into our distress, to take on our burdens and our infirmities, to take them all the way to, to death on a cross and to a grave. And thank you, God, that the stone rolled away and he beat the greatest enemy, death, to bring life. And so no matter what we're facing here, what stresses, what calamities, if we ride with the king, we have hope. Even death is not our end. That we have a king who rides in victory and we get to ride with him. Thank you, God, for the celebration of Easter that a hero came for us and there is joy waiting for those who will ride with the king. It's easy to celebrate. It's easy to worship when we know we've been rescued. Might we come today to celebrate and enjoy the rescuing one. And we pray that in his beautiful name. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group Director, and I'm here with Bible teacher Ben Stewart, who just brought our Easter message, and a great message it was um, from Psalms 118. Welcome right. back. Thank you. It's yeah. good to have you good back. Yeah, it's yeah. been a while, and um, really enjoyed your message today. We had a question that came in that we can just go ahead and jump right into. Okay. Um, if you were given the opportunity to talk with Josh Whedon. You mentioned him and right. the story about him being an atheist and the interview with the journalist. Um, yep. How would you connect the truth of what you heard in that with the overall truth that he was saying about the greater story? Like, How would you respond to him in that moment if right. you were able to sit in front of him? Yeah, well, um, just what method or tack I would take, I would say, I love the way Francis Schaeffer used to do it. He was sort of the C.S. Lewis to the hippies back in the 60s. And his whole line was, if you give me an hour with a person, I'm going to spend 55 minutes asking questions. Because the more you ask questions, the more you get to know someone and really get to see where they're at. And he said, and then I would spend the last few minutes sharing my thoughts, more precisely addressing the issues that's real for them. Mm -hmm. You know, so for him, I don't know where those convictions come from. There's probably some logical reasons behind it, but there's probably some pain in there too. And so I just wouldn't want to rush in with a sermon. I would want to ask him a lot of questions about his stories that he's written and directed and why he's passionate about them. And then how did you get to the belief system you have? And because there's a million ways you can arrive there and a million reasons. So I'd want to hear a lot from him first. I would ask a lot of questions. And then afterwards, you know, I think... 
if I if I only had the information I have now, you know, J.R. Tolkien, who wrote Lord of the Rings, helped C.S. Lewis come to Christ. And the way he did was showed Lewis all these stories you love are myths, and what's different about Jesus Christ is it's it's the myth, it's the same story, but it's the myth that actually happened. And that's how he started for him. Why, why is the same mythology popping up over and over again in all these stories? He said it had a root, it had a source, and he challenged Lewis to investigate Jesus. And it was, it was from there that Lewis became a, a believer in God and became a Christian, but it was by pushing him to say, all these stories you keep telling, they have a, they have a base in the real hero. And uh, I would try to focus him on Jesus. Yeah, I think. I hope um, that helps. But that's well, what I, I do. think. You walk away from from hearing something like that, and you think maybe there's like a answer for every single person when you're trying to evangelize, or a method, or a track, or anything like yeah. that. But really, it's what connects that person's story. It's very yeah. personal, How, and and like it's it, a there are story. There, there are atheist people that just came from a totally intellectual standpoint. You know, like Anthony Flew is one of those. But Anthony Flew. Uh, became at least a theist. I'm not sure if he became a Christian by now, but he wrote a book, There Is a God, that's about how for him the intellectual path to believing in God was satisfactory. Mm -hmm. Most atheists I've met are atheists. The argumentation came later. The atheism started because of anger, because they got mm -hmm. hurt. So if you just talk the ideas and miss their heart, you're not going to help them. Right. They'll just go get some new data, but mm -hmm. Um, so that's where you just really have to pay attention and love the person, not come zooming in with a sermon. Awesome. So we did Psalm 118 today, and I yes. know that you're also doing Psalm as the study at Breakaway this semester. That's Talk right. to us about that. Like what made you decide to do the Psalm study, and yeah. um, what can we look forward to next week? Yeah, well, I mean, the Psalms are beautiful. You know, everyone goes to them, and, and uh, they're the, it's the songbook of the Bible. And... At Breakaway, the way our schedule broke up, I thought, okay, I can do a couple Psalms, and then you gotta pick which ones mm -hmm. do I do, and right. everyone's got a different method. And what intrigued me was just asking the question, what are the songs that were the most sung by the people of Jesus, and why? So I just went through the Psalms and picked the top most quoted Psalms in the New Testament. And then for me, just entered in going, why were they? So it was kind of a fun journey yeah. for me. And it was weird to pop into this psalm and read it and go, oh, wow, this one shows up a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's all around Easter. Because when you first read the psalm, you don't necessarily go, oh, Easter. But trying to understand it and then doing my best to explain it. It was kind of fun for me. So. Yeah, it was fun for us, too. Yeah, great. Okay, <laughs> so we'll do something similar <laughs> next week. I'm really excited about next week, too. Okay, good. All right, well, thank you for being here with us today. Sure. And thank you guys for your questions. Join us back here next week for Postscript. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.